Hey, my name's Gene, and I'm an Adobe Certified Photoshop Instructor. I've been teaching college-level classes in Photoshop for over two decades. I love Photoshop. The first course, Photoshop for Beginners 1, is built for absolute beginners to just started beginners. You don't need any previous knowledge of Photoshop to enjoy and learn from that first video course. It covers these topics here. Now, I suggest you should have an understanding of these topics to get the most out of this free Photoshop course, which is part two of an ongoing series. This course will take your images to the next level while making Photoshop more fun and easier to use. And as always, we're going to work through a progression of real world image problems that every photographer and designer encounters every day. And I will not only show you the technique itself, but I will also explain the why behind it. So you're not just blindly following recipes, but you will have a true understanding of the when and the why to use the techniques that I cover now and in your future. The practice images for this course are free for you to download. The links are in the description below so you can follow along with me step by step. There are about a dozen consecutive videos that build on each other in this course. First, I'm going to cover brushes, how to change their size, their hardness, the slowest ways and the fastest ways to do this. And then how do you choose colors and paint with them on your image or on layer masks? Then I will cover all the ways to manipulate the foreground background color swatches, which govern almost every tool in Photoshop. Then I want to get back to brightness and contrast as a destructive editing method with bonus layer mask painting, spot retouching, and showing you how to fix converging lines. Then the video after that talks about using the brightness and contrast adjustment layer for non-destructive editing. And then I talk about the levels adjustment layer to show you how much more control you have over making specific areas of your image lighter or darker where you need it. Then I'm gonna cover a quick introduction to all the selection tools with three case studies using the spot healing brush, the content aware fill feature, and the clone stamp tool. Then I cover color, hue, saturation, and vibrance adjustment layers to do this and then to do this. And this takes us right back to the black and white adjustment layer with local color contrast adjustments using color sliders. There's even a bonus sepia color grading technique and a quick demo of how to get that exact same color grade on any image quickly. And finally, it culminates with a retouching case study for this surreal pano image. And above all, I'm going to be showing you how to do these things manually, but I'm also gonna cover over and over and over the best keyboard shortcuts for all these techniques that will speed up your workflows a thousand percent. I do it with these flashcards that just pop up on screen. This is gonna be a great course. So you know what time it is? It's Photoshop time. Yes! In this video, I wanted to show you the basics of the brush tool. There are a lot of tools in the Photoshop tools panel that use the brush tool aside from the brush, like the eraser tool, the smudge and blur tools, the dodge and burn tools, just to name a few. And one of the things that all of these tools have in common is a brush picker. Let's go up to the tool options bar and take a look at that. Now, if you don't see this, remember to go ahead and select the brush tool. Whenever you select a tool, the options for that tool open up in this tool options bar. If you click the disclosure triangle, for this icon, you'll get the brush picker, which allows you to adjust the size of your brush and the hardness of your brush. This is how you adjust the size by dragging the slider back and forth. So if I come over here with a hardness of 100% and an opacity of 100%, which you can also adjust here, notice the character of the line that I just made. It's very hard edged. Let me go into 100% by hitting Command or Control 1. I'll hold the space bar just to move it down a little bit. So with each stroke, it's very hard and crisp, right? Now, if I come back to the brush picker and I pull my hardness all the way down to zero, notice the character of the line. See how soft the edges are? This is really helpful when you're painting on masks and you need a soft, fuzzy edge instead of a crisp edge. Now, you can also vary the size of your brush just by dragging the size up and coming over. So there's a big soft brush and pull this back to 100%. Here's a big hard brush. You see the difference. So those characters are really important to know how they work. Now, let's undo all this. Since I haven't saved this image since I opened it, I can just go up to File and back to revert. It will revert the image back to the originally saved version. So there's actually a more efficient way to adjust the size of your brush instead of coming up to this brush picker every time, because you have to click out of it to make it disappear. If you just hit the left bracket key, which is beside the letter P on your keyboard, one tap, two tap, three tap, four tap, you see how it's making my brush smaller? And then if I hit the right bracket key, which is just to the right 
of the left bracket key, it makes my brush bigger. So I can very quickly adjust the size of my brush in increments by using the left and right bracket keys. Let's remove those by just going back to File and Revert. So in addition to choosing the size and hardness of your brush, probably the two other most common things you'll use with your brush tools are the opacity, which is here. So again, this is at 100% opacity, right? And actually, let's go ahead and change the color of the brush. There are a lot of ways you can change the color of your brush. Typically, the color is stored in the foreground background swatches right here, with the very top one being the foreground swatch and the back one being the background swatch. But if I come over to my tabs and toggle on color, I can pick a color for my brush from here just by like picking that red and you see how it changed the foreground color to red here and all the way over here. Another thing I can do is toggle on the swatches. If I have a pre-selected swatch that I like or that I've made or created, and you see as I've selected it here, it loads it and saves it into my foreground over here. If you don't see your color or swatches, you can always go up to window and just put a check mark beside them and it'll bring them to the front for you. Now, with the color selected, see now I, can, I can paint with a color. Now, what if I wanted to change the color of this flower? Manually, really carefully try to paint well, look what's happening. One, I'm not doing a really good job with my edges, and it's just coming out as a very flat color of paint. I don't see the texture of the flower itself. This is where you can lower the opacity to maybe help with that. So I'll drag right up here. Okay, here's a quick tip about scrubby sliders, and they work on anything that has a variable number that you can change by dragging a slider. Scrubby sliders are much quicker. I can just hover over the word and drag left or right to lower or raise the percentage of the opacity. I'm going to go down to around 50%. Okay, that, that works much better, right? I can see below and I can see my flower, but it, it, it's more of a tint now, though. It still doesn't quite look right. I'm going to drag that back to 100%. Now let me show you the blend modes. These blend modes are the same ones that you can find over here in the layer blend modes, but these are only visible if you have more than one layer. In later videos, I'm going to cover all the differences and nuances of these categories of blend modes that are great for photographers and designers. But for now, for this exercise, I'm just going to choose the color blend mode. I'm at 100% opacity. And I'm just going to come over and start painting. And do you see how this is basically letting me change the color of the flower without changing the luminance values? See on this one where I painted with a lower opacity, see how it made the highlights darker? But see how I'm retaining all of my highlight and shadow information in proper relationship. So this really gives me the benefit of being able to do a nice job. But again, look how hard it is to paint these edges, especially here. These are kind of blurry edges and these are sharp edges. Let me show you how you would fix this. Again, I haven't saved this image since I've opened it. So I'm just going to go up to File and Revert. I'm going to hold the space bar, raise this up a little bit, and I'm going to jump ahead and show you something with this quick selection tool. If you don't see it right away, just hold down the disclosure triangle and choose quick selection tool. I'm gonna tap my right bracket key to make my, my brush of the selection tool bigger. And then I'm just gonna paint over the flower. And see how it did a really good job of selecting the flower? The selection is indicated by the marching ants. And I'm gonna give you some really detailed videos on all the selection tools, but we're gonna cover them in this video series too. So now that I have a quick selection of this flower, I'm gonna go back to my brush tool, which I can hit B for brush, or just click it here. I'm gonna leave blue in my foreground. I'm going to come over to my swatches panel and choose yellow. See yellow is loaded in my foreground. I'm going to leave the blend mode set to color at 100% opacity. I'm just going to hold the right bracket key down to get a really giant brush really fast. Now watch this. I can just paint over the flower without being careful because the selection is restricting the color to be just in that selection. If I want to change that to a light cyan, if I want to change that to a green, if I want to change that to a red, if I want to change that to a pink, I think I like the red the best. You see how that works and how easily you can change the color of a specific object in a photograph? And then you can go up to select and deselect to get rid of those marching ants, or you can just hit command or control D. There you go. That's a quick way to change the color of an object in Photoshop. In this video, I wanted to cover the foreground and background colors and show you how you can change those colors. They're located at the bottom of the tools panel, right down here. The front square, mine's currently black, is the foreground color. The one underneath 
is the background color. Now the background color does not come into play very often. For instance, it is used in the gradient tool, which is right here. So if I were to choose the gradient tool, do you see in the options bar, it's saying that it will give me a gradient from black to white. So if I click inside my image and draw a line, it will change everything from black to white in a nice gradation. We'll get into this in later videos for sure, because it's really interesting. Find this video on my channel. I'm going to hit Command or Control Z to get out of that. So the reason the foreground and background colors are significant is because the brush tool, the shape tools, the type tool, and many other features that apply color use the color in the foreground color box at the bottom of the tools panel. And there are multiple ways to set that foreground color. You can select the eyedropper tool and sample a color from the image. You can use the color picker, the color panel, or the swatches panel, which I'll cover in the next video. So what I would like to show you is the simplest way to select the color for your foreground color. Choose the eyedropper tool right here and hover over your image and click on the color you would like to sample. Like let's say I'd like to sample this light pink. You see how that loaded automatically into my foreground? And now I can swap the foreground and background colors by hitting this arrow right here, or I can tap the X key and that will also switch my foreground and background colors back and forth, which is really handy if I'm using it for painting on the image itself or on a layer mask. So now while I still have the eyedropper selected. I'm gonna select a dark pink from my flower. And do you see how that loaded in the foreground now? And again, hit the X key or this double arrow to switch my foreground and background colors. This would allow me to hit B for the brush and I'll change my blend mode back to normal. Whenever you choose a tool, just take a quick look at the options bar and make sure your blend mode's at normal and your opacity's at 100%. Those are the two things that will make a tool not behave the way you think it should because Photoshop has sticky settings. It's going to remember the last setting you used, even if it was three days ago, and then you may not remember that you changed this. So always take a quick look at that. If you're unsure of what these settings are, if you just go up to the tool that shows at the front, I've chosen the brush tool, so that's the tool that is displaying. If you right click on that, you can just reset the tool and it'll reset all of these to the default values. I'm going to hit my right bracket key to make my brush bigger, and I'm painting with some soft pink, and you see how that works. Then I can hit the letter X and quickly switch over to start painting with the darker color. Now, if I want to go back to my default colors, I can either hit the D key for default color, or I can hit this little mini black and white foreground icon, and it will reset my color swatches to the default, which is black and white. And again, I can hit the X key to rotate them. And this is really handy, especially when you're painting on a mask, because mask only accepts black, white, and all shades of gray. So this is just a quick introduction to the foreground background color swatches and how you can introduce color into them. Now let's get a bit more into all the ways that you can change the color of your foreground and background swatches. Yes! In this video, I wanted to show you the three main ways to change your foreground color outside of the eyedropper tool. Because remember, the brush tool, the shape tools, the type tool, and many other features that apply color, they use the color in the foreground color box, which is right down here at the bottom of the tools panel. And there are multiple ways to set the foreground color. For instance, you already know you can select the eyedropper tool right here and then hover over your image and choose the specific color that you want. For instance, I'll choose this light pink and that loaded into my foreground. Now behind the foreground is the background color box, and this is where you can store another color. To switch the foreground and background color boxes to quickly access either color, all you have to do is click this double pointed arrow just above the two color boxes, and it will switch from foreground to background. Keyboard shortcut is just to hit the X key, which is also my favorite keyboard shortcut, especially when I'm painting on layer masks. Now, I want to show you how to have a more full featured way to choose your color. If you just click once on the foreground color swatch, it's gonna load the color picker. If it's in your way, just click on the title bar and you can move it to wherever you want. Now notice that my cursor automatically changed and was pre-selected to be the eyedropper tool because that's the default tool that comes with this color picker. So by default, you have this vertical bar that has all the hues. So here you would drag that vertical bar to choose the hue that you wanted or the color. Hue and color are the same thing. And you see how the box to the left shifts to align with these pointers? So this is the pink that I want. Now I can choose inside this large color box to choose other properties because remember the hue is only one property. There's, a, there's also saturation and brightness of a color. So if I want a fully saturated bright color, I need to come all the way up to the upper right. 
This is the purest color that I can get right here. When I make a choice, it loads it in this new box and below it shows me what the last color I had was. Now, if I want a desaturated pink, I'm gonna come to the left. I say at the top, if I want it to be a bright desaturated color, I come down to the left if I want it to be a dark desaturated color. If I want it to be a very saturated dark color, I need to come back to the right. Do you see how that works? So this is the purest form of color. This is the brightest all the way up to pure white. These two bottom corners go all the way to pure black. So the thing to remember is the left to right controls the saturation of the color. See how it gets more and more desaturated all the way to gray as I go to the far left in that new box. Another option is to enter the exact color values into the HSB, the RGB, the CMYK, or the hexadecimal color fields. It just depends on what you want. So you know color theory, right? Like the world is only made up of red, green, and blue light as it comes from any light source. And Photoshop measures that from zero to 255. Zero is pure black, 255 is pure white. Now remember, to have pure white, you have to have 255 in the red, green, and blue color channels. See how it auto-selected pure white and it gave me a new block of white because I have 255 in all all of these. Now, if I want a pure red, I just need to go in and manually enter zero into my green and blue. 255 in just one channel is the purest color of that channel. You can see it chose the purest area of that box, giving me pure red. Now, notice my foreground hasn't changed because it's not going to change until I click OK. And then as a last thing, from inside the color picker, if I pull my cursor outside of that color picker, I can actually choose a color from anywhere in my image still. And it automatically chose that specific color, that specific saturation, that specific brightness. And I just click OK, and then it loads into my foreground color swatch. What if you want to use the color panel or the swatches panel? Well, just come over here. And if you don't see them, go to window and just put a check mark beside color or by swatches. You see swatches is automatically checked because that's the one I have selected. So this stores all kinds of default color chips that you can select from. So if I choose this yellow, notice some things that happened. It auto loaded in my foreground color swatch right over here. And it also put yellow up here, which is basically Photoshop keeps track of all the recent colors you've used to make it easy on you. So in case you're going in and out of a lot of different folders. So if I choose green, notice it shifted the green back to the very front of the line and it changed my foreground to green. So that's a nice way to pick a color if you've been saving them or creating them. Let's go over to the color panel. You notice it's very much like the, the color picker, but there's a difference. Do you see the difference? Like as I choose my color on the vertical scale, I have a replica of the foreground background, which is a live replica of my foreground background. So notice my foreground is changing as I drag this. If I drag this to red, it automatically changed to red. I didn't have to click OK anywhere. So this is a, a, like a quicker live way to, to change your colors super quick. The color panel acts like a mini color picker in which you can choose the color hue from the slider and then adjust the brightness and saturation in the color box. Then the color you choose appears instantly in the foreground color box over in the tools panel. The color panel doesn't offer as many options as the color picker, but the advantage of this panel is that you can leave it open on your screen for quick access. And remember, in the swatches, to pick a color from a preset color swatch in the swatches panel, if you don't see the swatches panel on your screen, just go up to the menu bar, go to window, and choose swatches. And then click on the swatch or the colored square in the swatches panel to change the foreground color to that selected color. I hope that's given you a brief overview of all the ways that you can change the color of your foreground color swatch in the tools panel. How to adjust the brightness and contrast of your image. Because a lot of times when you take a photograph with your camera or your phone, sometimes the image comes out uh, way too bright or even way too dark. So I want to show you how to fix that in the easiest way possible. So I'm going to hit the letter D just to get my default colors back to black and white. And notice this image. Notice how it's very dark. Now for those of you that understand histograms, which I'm sure if you're a photographer you do, I'm going to go up to window and down to histogram just so that I can see a histogram. Now I don't care about the color histogram, so I'm just gonna check luminosity. And this is what I would see on the back of my camera. We all know that the left side of the histogram is pure black, the right side is pure white, and everything in between is all the levels of gray. And generally, we want that histogram to be shifted to the right, because this is where more of the tones are 
and they're better quality tones. So we need to make this brighter for sure. So let me show you a very easy way to adjust the brightness and contrast of your image. Just come up to image, go down to adjustments and choose brightness and contrast. It's gonna load a box in front of your image that you can grab the title bar and move it to wherever you want. Now, generally I would say with today's versions of Photoshop, which are so sophisticated, click the auto button right away and just see where Photoshop thinks it should be. I think it did a really good job. I mean, that looks nice. I have a full range of tones, obviously based on the histogram, I don't have pure white yet, but as you'll learn in the Munker White illusion videos that I've created, Color lines are going across different balls, and this is the illusion. All the balls are the exact same kind of flesh color uh, that our eye will deceive us. So it's really about relative tones. Relatively speaking, this looks like a brighter image that has a full range from white to black. Now our eyes auto adjust. So if you want to see what it looked like before, just toggle off the preview icon here. Wow, that's really dark and dull, isn't it? Now you can always manually come up and drag these sliders to wherever you want. Now, if you want to start back from zero, instead of having to drag it back to exactly zero or select it and hit the zero to get it back to zero, an advanced tip is if you hold down the Alt or Option key, it changes your cancel button to a reset button, allowing you to reset everything. And I like to do this because I see a lot of students that will just cancel to close it. They'll come back, image, adjustments, brightness, and contrast, and then they'll start all over. But remember, all you have to do is hold down the Alt or Option key, and the cancel button will change the reset in pretty much every dialog box in Photoshop where you have an OK and cancel selection. So actually, I think the auto did a really good job. I might tweak it a little bit just so I can feel like I had a part of it, but I think that's great. Now, one thing to take note of, whenever you brighten up a dark image, you're going to reveal a lot of noise in the dark shadow areas. I'm gonna zoom in by holding down the command and space bar to temporarily change my cursor to a magnifying glass and click. I'm at 200%. I'll let go of the command key and with just a space bar, I'll click and drag. So I'm at 200% to make sure you can see this through video. You really don't need to view your image more than at 100% resolution, which is found right down here. This box always tells you what the magnification of your image is. And again, you never really need to go above 100%. So do you see all these pixelation? There's actually a little bit of JPEG artifacting. Do you see the color shifts? So that's that's a potential problem. I'll hit Command-0 to shrink it back in screen. If I toggle the preview on and off, this is a way better solution. So I'm gonna click OK. Another advanced tip, photographers, designers, digital media artists, pretty much everybody always has to do something in a creative way that's not specifically photographic. So if I wanted to take this image and screen it back to be behind some text or on a website, if you go back up to image adjustments and brightness and toggle on these legacy controls and you pull that brightness way up, and that contrast down, now watch this. I'm gonna click OK, then I'm gonna go up again, brightness and contrast, and I can choose legacy, and I can do it all over again. Now, as I bring the brightness up, I get these white hot spots. So lowering the contrast makes those go away. But this gives me a, a nice screen back effect that's very different than lowering the opacity. So you can repeat this over and over and over until you get the density of an image that you like. So I reverted back to the original brightness and contrast adjustment that we made. Now notice what it did, it applied it to the background base image, which means if I save this, close it, that setting is gonna be forever baked into the image. And if I try to adjust it again after I've baked it in, it's gonna degrade the image. In this video, I'm going to cover the difference between destructive editing and non-destructive editing with adjustment layers. Now, Photoshop keeps the destructive adjustments separate from the non-destructive adjustments. That's why all the adjustments up in the menu bar for image adjustments, these are all destructive edits which means just what it says. It's going to kind of degrade your image when you apply them, save them. You can never really undo them in an easy way that doesn't alter your image quality. The good thing is you have all of these controls as adjustment layers. Adjustment layers can be found right over here under adjustments. If you don't see yours, go to window and just put a check mark beside adjustments. All of these little icons, if you hover over them, Brightness and contrast, levels, curves, are the exact same ones as over here. Brightness, contrast, levels, curves. You have a few extra ones over here that are not over here, but that's okay. And you can actually access this list at the bottom of your layers panel. If you go down to the black and white circle, toggle it open, you'll see you have brightness and contrast, levels, curves, but then you have a few other additional 
adjustment layers that you do not have at the very top. But I like these visual icons because they're I don't have to open up a sub menu. They're visually there and they're pretty easy to recognize. Like the brightness and contrast looks like a sun. The levels looks like the histogram. So let's revert this image back to its original. Go to file and revert. So once it's reverted back to its original file, let's add a brightness and contrast adjustment layer. Now notice what it did. I didn't get a floating dialog box that I had to move out of my way. Instead, it loaded the brightness and contrast adjustments right here in the properties panel. So you have the same adjustments. Here's the brightness, here's the contrast, there's the legacy option, there's the auto. And remember, I said generally always click auto first. See what Photoshop thinks. Remember, it uses an artificial intelligence to figure out the best possible adjustment based on its hundreds of thousands of images that it's analyzed. And based on this, I think it did a really good job, not even knowing that it's a leaf. So how do you see the before? Well, instead of the preview box, you have this little eyeball icon. Just click the eyeball on and off. Wow, that really is dark and dull, right? And notice what happens. This eyeball is connected to this eyeball but you can also toggle on and off to see the adjustment layer. That's the key word, adjustment layer, because this adjustment is now separated from the background and it's on its own layer and it comes with a layer mask. Nice. Now the interesting thing about this is there is no cancel button because it's automatically applied to this layer. I don't have to apply it. I don't have to click OK. It's just done. It just happens. But if I want to reset this, just click on this icon and it resets everything that you did. But I really like the auto, so I'm gonna click auto, just so I feel like I had some creative control. Maybe I'll make the teeny bit brighter there. And now, when I save this, and let me go ahead and save this. I'll go up to file, save as. It converted the JPEG to a PSD because it has a layer in it. Because remember, JPEGs are flattened files. But .psd documents, which are Photoshop documents, that's the native file in a Photoshop document, lets you save up to 4,000 layers. And it's going to say the format is now Photoshop. It's saving all my layers. And it's saving this color profile, which sRGB is perfect for online web use, monitor use, etc. I'm just going to click Save. I've already saved this because I've already done it. But I'm just going to hit Replace. And it's going to replace it. Now watch this. When I close this, and then I pop back in Bridge, and I see my JPEG file, and I see my PSD file. And if you want to look at them side by side, select the first one, hold the Command or Control key, select the second one, and hit Command or Control B. It will load them full screen side by side so you can see the edit you've made. X out of that. I'm going to come back to just this one, double click it to open it, and look what happened. It opened my image with my adjustment. So I can say, ooh, I think I want to reset that adjustment and redo it a bit because I, I want a different, a different look, a bit more contrast, which means you have forever editability when you save as adjustment layers. So remember, to adjust the brightness and contrast of an image, in the menu bar, select Image, Adjustments, Brightness and Contrast. And there you can adjust the brightness slider to change the overall brightness of the image. Adjust the contrast slider to increase or decrease the contrast. Click OK. And then the adjustments will appear only on the selected layer. To perform the same tasks, but to add an adjustment layer, in the Layers panel, you just select an image layer that you want to affect with the adjustment, and you can go to the bottom of the Layers panel or to the top where the icons are and choose the Brightness and Contrast Adjustment Layer. A new adjustment layer will appear in the Layers panel above the image layer you selected. This adjustment layer will only affect the layers below it. The Properties panel opens automatically displaying the controls for this adjustment. Now, different kinds of adjustment layers present different controls in the properties panel. In later videos, I'm gonna cover the hue saturation adjustment layer and the black and white adjustment layer. All of these adjustment layers allow you to customize your image in the way that you want. Yes! In this video, I'm going to show you how to take this image and make it look like this one with the brightness and contrast adjustment layer dodging and burning on that layer mask and some minor spot retouching. So as I look at this image, it appears a bit flat and dull to me, maybe a tiny bit dark. Remember, you can always go up to window and toggle on the histogram. Okay, it's, it's not a bad histogram, but there are no real whites or light tones, right? We can see that they're missing right over here. So that's good to know. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a non-destructive 
brightness and contrast adjustment layer because that's pretty much the easiest way to fix this. But before I do that, there's some things that I don't like. Like I find this elevator thing distracting. I find that fireman safety lock distracting. I find this little bit right here of color distracting. I like the grunge on the elevator doors, but I don't like these little white dots and scratches. This little string is very visually distracting as well as the string down here. So I think I'm gonna retouch that out real quick. And instead of doing it on my background layer, I can either hit Command or Control J to duplicate it, or I can just hit this plus inside of a square, which will add a blank new layer. And you can tell because it's transparent, right? You see the white and gray checkerboard. Transparent layers are indicated by this white and gray checkerboard pattern all throughout Photoshop. That's an indication of a transparency inside Photoshop. And let's go ahead and just grab the spot retouching tool, which is this one right here. If you don't see yours, just click and drill down until you see it and then select it. Remember your left and right bracket keys to make your brush bigger or smaller. And you just want your brush to be a little bigger than what you're retouching. And you just click and it automatically gets rid of it. Now this one, I'm on right bracket key. Remember over by the letter P and I'm on paint over it and Photoshop's gonna look around and figure it out. It's gonna look around and figure it out. Now I'm gonna hold down the command and space bar to zoom in, left bracket key for a smaller brush. Maybe you just want your brush to be a little bit bigger than what you're retouching. Cause I, I wanna remove the things that are distracting. I can hold the space bar key to pan around. There's a little string I don't like. I don't like that. And make my brush a little bigger with the right bracket key so I can just do some quick clicks and paints. Get a couple at once there with that one. Anything that is visually distracting. Now you have to be careful not to go crazy. Again, I'm a little bit zoomed in. Notice my magnification's at 200%. Really, you don't have to go above 100, but sometimes if you go up a little larger, it does make it kind of quicker and easier to see the problems. Okay, I think I fixed all the major retouching issues, the things that were bothering me. I'll hit Command or Control Zero to go back to full screen, maybe because I'm have a problem. I'll get rid of that little dot right there. Now let's toggle off our layer that we just made all the retouches on. Toggle them on and off. You see how visually busy it was before? I mean, our eye was ignoring it, but notice how much more crisp and clean it looks. I don't see those little lines in the outfit. I still have the grunge of the atmosphere, but not all the distracting elements. Now you can click over here on the layer one. If you double click that name, it automatically selects itself and you can just type retouch. Enter. That way, if you get 10 layers or 100 layers, you'll remember which layer has your retouching on it. Now, the reason we put this on as new layers is because I still haven't permanently altered this background layer, which is great. I feel like it's a little lifeless. So let's add a brightness and contrast adjustment layer. And I just think it needs to be a little brighter. We're in that little gray area because the brightness and contrast adjustment is a universal adjustment. It's applying the same settings to the highlights, the midtones, and the shadows, and everything in between. So for me, I think she looks good. The doors look good here at this brightness setting. But I find that I'm blowing out the lighter wall around it. And now that lighter wall, I'm finding kind of distracting. That's why we have these layer masks. And this layer, the brightness and contrast layer, is the one selected because you can see the lighter gray. But the thing that's most selected is the layer mask. See the white corners? Because if I click over here, now the adjustment is most selected. But I click here, the layer mask is most selected. And what I'm gonna do is paint on that layer mask. I'm gonna hit B for the brush. I'll hit D for default colors, just to get my black and white over here going. And if I don't have black in the foreground, I need black to paint on this white mask. So I'll just click these double arrows or hit the X key. I'll take a quick look at my options bar and I'll see I'm at a normal blend mode 100%, which is where I wanna start off. I'll tap the right bracket key a little and I'll just paint. All right, see I'm bringing back too much of the original. Command Z, because remember, toggle that on and off. Look how dull and flat and dark that looks. So I definitely like the vibrance and the brightness of her, but I can't paint back at 100% of its original tone. So what I'll do is I'll just drag this down to maybe 40%. A scrubby slider is when you hover over a word and your cursor changes to a left or right pointing arrow and you just drag it back and forth to vary the opacity. It's like bring back 40% of that original darkness. I feel like that's not bad. It gives me texture in the wall. You can hit Commander or Control minus to zoom out a touch. That way I can just, with a big soft brush, I can pass across the top once. Now if I pass again, it's gonna do another 40%. 
So if I wanted something on the very edge right here, I could do that. So toggle off what I did. Flat, Command-0 to fit in screen. I'll toggle that eyeball back on. A lot more interest in, in dynamic coloring. Remember, an adjustment layer will affect every single layer below it. And there's some tricks to get around that, which you're going to learn in this series. But just know that whether I have 100 layers, 1,000 layers, or just these two layers, the brightness and contrast is affecting all the stuff on this retouching layer and everything on the background layer, which is perfect. That's exactly what I want. So that's how you edit a mask. And if you want to see your mask specifically, just hold down the Alt or Option key and click on it, and you'll see your mask in the display window. Remember, with mask, white reveals, black conceals and then any shade of gray partially reveals and conceals. Click the eyeball icon to bring it back to regular view. Save this as a PSD working file if you want to continue editing it. And I've got to say that while we're here, there does seem to be a problem with the converging lines. Let's take this one step further. If you hit Command, Option, Shift, Letter E, or Control, Alt, Shift, Letter E, it's going to compress every single layer to the very, very top layer. So once you've compressed everything to the very top layer, go up to Filter and down to Camera Raw Filter, which is going to load the Adobe Camera Raw dialog box. And we're going to have a ton of videos about Adobe Camera Raw. It's incredibly powerful. It's where I spend most of my editing if I'm not in Photoshop. I'm going to toggle the basic panel close by clicking this arrow. And I'm going to go down to Geometry. You have some automated tools here. I'm just going to say, I want all my vertical lines to be vertical. So I'm going to click that and it will automatically straighten up my vertical lines. Let's see what the automatic did. Automatic's not bad either. So here's none, right? Do you see how the lines converge a little bit at the bottom? It's very minor. I think that looks better though. I like that. So I'm going to click OK. So I can toggle this off. That's before, this is after. Before, after. So sometimes it's OK that it's not perfect and straight. Sometimes converging lines are nice. I think I like this better though. Hope that helped. In this video, I wanted to show you the pitfalls of the brightness and contrast adjustment and then show you the overwhelming benefits of the levels adjustment layer. So looking at this image and thinking of your histogram, what's missing? Do we have white tones in this image? Do we have black tones in this image? We don't have the fullest range. If I click on my little histogram icon here to bring it open, if I can click this exclamation point, that just means it updates the histogram. And I definitely have no pure blacks. I'm missing a few of the dark tones. I have no pure whites, and I'm missing a few of the highlight tones. But our eye doesn't quite see that. But this is a flat image. It's actually a perfect example of a flat image, because typically a flat image is missing both black and white tones. Although it can be called a flat image if it's missing just black or just white. So let's fix this. If I were to add a brightness and contrast adjustment layer to this, go right to my properties panel. It's like, okay, well, I need to make it brighter because I don't have pure white yet. All right. So how do I get the blacks? Maybe if I bring up the contrast, I can get more blacks. Okay. I'm stretched it out. I still don't have pure black. I'm starting to get pure black, but now I've blown out my highlights. So I think, well, maybe I need to bring my highlights down. Okay. That's good. That's getting me more towards pure black, but now I'm losing my pure white. This is kind of the downfall of the brightness and contrast. It's a universal application over all of the tones in your image with the same power. Basically, it's like taking a hammer and the same force you would use to hit a nail is the same force being used to kill a fly. It's overkill in some areas and it's not enough for other areas. So this is where I want to show you another way to adjust the tones in your image. I'm just going to hit delete. And if you're on an adjustment layer, the first delete deletes the layer mask. The second delete deletes the adjustment. Now let's go up to the levels adjustment layer which looks just like this histogram right here. But if you hover over it, it says levels. And I'll go ahead and close this because I don't need that histogram anymore because I get a built-in histogram. And if I can't see everything, just hover in between the properties panel and the layers panel and just drag down a little bit so you can see all the information that you see on the screen now. The easiest way to fix an image that's missing blacks and or whites is just to drag the slider that's missing something to the base of the data mountain. This is the data mountain. This is the histogram. This is showing you the tones in your image. So if I just take this black slider and I drag it to the base of the mountain, do you see how that didn't change my highlights at all? It pushed everything to the left of this histogram to pure black and it recentered my midtones equally between the blacks and the whites. So now I'm going to grab the white slider and pull it over. And now I can readjust the midtones to taste while still maintaining my blacks and whites. See how that gives you control over the three big tones in your image, but in an individual way? And watch this. I'm going to click this reset icon. If you hold down your Alt or Option key while you drag one of them, it's going to show you where the tones first start to show up. Okay, it looks like in the cyan, I'm starting to get pure black. 
see how far into it I've got to come before I start getting true pure black, which is right there. But I don't like the look of that. So sometimes you got to balance out what is the technically accurate black or the visually balanced black that's the best. So again, normally come come close to the bottom of the mountain and it'll get you there. I'll hold down the alt or option key while I drag the white slider. So this is where I'm starting to get pure white. At that point, I'm blowing out everything, right? So I just need a balance. And you see how it's sort of ends around the base of the mountain. So I'm just going to leave it there. So this is the advantage of considering to use levels for your adjustments because you get controls over your highlight areas, your shadow areas, and your midtone areas in three separate ways. And this is by far the easiest tool to use that gives you the most control. I hope that helped. Yes! I'm going to show you how to make this image look like this one. So first, let's cover some things. If you want to adjust the vibrance of an image in the menu bar, I want you to go to Select, Image, Adjustments, Vibrance. Go up to Image, Adjustments, and choose Vibrance. The Vibrance slider affects the intensity of the colors. It has the strongest effect on the muted colors in the image. The Saturation slider increases the color intensity of all colors in the image. And then just click OK when you're done. So let's do it. Go up to your image menu item, choose adjustments, go down to vibrance, and then just drag the slider to taste. 100%. You see how it didn't really make our eyes bleed because it brightened up the things that weren't already super bright? Now here's a saturation slider. Now that makes your eyes bleed, right? That, that's pushed it to the intensity where it doesn't even look real anymore. So that's where you want to kind of make a balance of what you've done. And if you forget where you came from, just toggle on that preview icon on and off. So the vibrance adjustment is really a good one to use when you don't want to come up with these crazy oversaturated images. You just want to boost the colors that are a little flat, like that red's a little flat. So this pulls them up without oversaturating everything. Now, when I click OK, we all have learned this is a destructive edit. The good thing is if I click Cancel, I can do the same edit over here with the vibrance adjustment layer. Now, if I want to adjust the hue and saturation of the colors of an image, I will go up to the menu bar, select image, adjustments, hue and saturation. And then I'd experiment by adjusting the hue, saturation, and lightness sliders. And these changes will affect all the colors in the image. So image, adjustment, hue and saturation. So the hue is gonna shift the colors of everything over the entire image, which is really powerful for some artistic or graphic design control sometimes. And then I can pull the saturation down or I can pull it way up. I can make the lightness just to fade it back a bit or make it a little dark. It all depends on what you're using it for as to what it is that you want to do. But again, remember this is destructive, but we know that we can come over here and add a hue saturation adjustment layer, have all the same controls and forever editability. Thing to remember, is the hue slider changes the colors in an image. The saturation slider affects the intensity of the colors in an image. The lightness slider affects the brightness of colors in an image. So now let's make this image look like this one. So essentially I wanna crop it to a square. So I'm gonna choose the crop tool here. I'm gonna go up to ratio and choose one to one square. And then I will pull on this lower right corner. And I wanna be careful because I don't want any of this wood floor. I find that distracting. I don't want to see underneath the couch. I want to come into the couch. I want to come as close to her as I can, but I don't want her to be dead centered. So now I'm going to click inside and drag around. Trying, trying for rule of thirds as much as I can without cropping her elbow. I think that looks weird. So it's a balance. I don't want to be too close to the bottom of her shoe. I need a little negative space for breathing room. That's kind of a nice balance of everything I can do. So I'm going to click enter to lock that in. Command or Control Zero to fill the screen. And what is it I want to change? Well, we're going to change a lot, right? I definitely want this wall to be redder. So let's come over and add a vibrance adjustment layer. Come down and just drag that vibrance slider up. So that red looks really nice. I like the direction it went. I went a little bit too far on her skin tone. So I want to hit B for the brush or select it right over here. I'm going to hit D for default colors or tap the X key to get black into my foreground because I want to paint on this white mask because essentially I want to remove some of that vibrance effect from her face and around the edge of her hair. So again, I look at my options bar. I'm at normal. Last time I was here is at 40%. So I'm just going to hover over the word and drag to the left to lower that percentage. 
A scrubby slider is when you hover over a word and your cursor changes to a left or right pointing arrow and you just drag it back and forth to vary the opacity. I'm gonna say I wanna reduce it by 50%. Left bracket key to make my brush a little smaller. And I'm gonna paint over her skin color and just over the edge of her skin. And again, I'm just wanting to subdue how it made her skin tone. And I'm gonna pass again. So I'm now doing 50% of 50% because it kind of works together like that. Okay, now looking at this, I'm thinking I'm gonna to need to make some adjustments. Command zero to fit in screen. So I'm gonna go ahead and go back to my background layer, select it, hit Command or Control J, because I wanna keep that original. I wanna see where I've come from. And now I'm on the background copy. And I think the first thing I wanna do is I wanna get rid of some of this wall stuff. I'm not gonna use the quick selection tool. Instead, I'm gonna come down to the spot healing brush, select it, right bracket key to make my, my brush a little bigger. And I'm just gonna come and click on a lot of these white water spots or stains, whatever I find that's particularly visually distracting, this keeping me out of the moment. I mean, I like the distressed texture in the background. I'm not trying to get rid of that. I don't like this line right here. I'm just gonna hold the space bar, grab it and move it up a little. I'm gonna try to paint this and see what it does. Hey, it didn't do bad. A lot of times the spot healing brush won't do a great job toward edges. But that did a really nice job. Space bar to pan down, left bracket key to make a smaller brush. I don't like that little line right there. Okay, I've gotten rid of the bulk of the distracting watermarks, which I, I like a lot better. Command zero to fit in screen. So now what do I wanna do? I wanna change the color of the shoes. And you've already watched the video how to manually select and paint with a color blend mode with the color you've chosen. But I wanna show you an even easier way. So while I'm here on this layer, I'm gonna go up to select and choose color range. And then I'm going to come in the image, my cursor changes to an eyedropper and I'm just going to click. And do you see this little black box? That's my image and that white area is what I've selected. So I'm gonna hold down the shift key. Notice how my cursor has a plus icon beside it now. And I'm just gonna kind of drag over everything that's that color and see how it selected all of that shoe for me. Maybe I need a little bit of this reflection in the couch, the rest of the shoe right here. I need this part of the shoe, this part of the shoe. I need the dark part and the light parts of the front of the shoe. Now I don't need it to get her leg, so I'm holding the alter option key and that puts a minus beside my cursor. And you see as I'm painting over it, it's getting rid of it up here. You may have to drag your fuzziness sliders and your range. So the range says, how far around the image can we look at? and you wanna keep it pretty restricted here. And if it's not restricting enough, just check localized color clusters. You see how it's kind of getting the same tones up in the wall, but I'm willing it to just select the colors where I'm clicking. So localized color cluster does a great job with that. See, I pretty much just have the shoes. Once I get it about to where I want, I'm gonna click okay. So now I have an active selection on my shoes. Looks like I didn't quite get everything. I'm gonna hold the command and space bar so that I can zoom in. Space bar only so I can pan up because I really wanna fill my screen with the shoes. You see where I've missed stuff? Now I can come back with the quick selection tool right here, left bracket key, and I can say, how did that do? That did pretty good. Hold down the alt option or alt key. I wanna get rid of her leg there. I want all of this orange. I want all of that orange. I want all of that orange and I want all of this orange. I'm gonna paint all through here. So I need all of that. Alter option, because I don't need your fingernail. Don't need your fingernail. Paint right back across. It's a learning algorithm. So the more passes you make, the better job it's going to do. Okay, I think I've roughly done a pretty, pretty decent job. Now I want this mask to be a little soft, but I'm gonna do that later. What I want to do is change the color of the shoes to green. Oop, there's a little bit over here. So instead of me hand painting this, how about I let Photoshop do the work for me? Wait, there's a bonus tip. Yes! When you choose any of the adjustment layers with an active selection, the adjustment layer will save the selection in the mask that comes with it based on the hue and saturation adjustment layer. So I'm just gonna click hue and saturation and watch what happens because I have an active selection. You can see the black and white moving dots they're called marching ants because it looks like ants marching all the way around and it's marching around the thing that's selected. Whenever you add any adjustment layer with an active selection, it's gonna create a mask for you automatically with that selection. Watch what happens. I'll click that. 
Do you see how it just made a mask for me on the hue and saturation adjustment layer? If I hold the Alt or Option key and click on that mask, well, that's the mask. That's what it just made for me. So now this means when I, now right now in the Properties panel, I'm only seeing adjustments for the mask, right? So I need to activate my hue and saturation by clicking on it, making it most selected. And I'm coming up to the hue because I want to change the color. Remember, I want to change it to green. So essentially, I just drag one direction. You can choose any color, but for this, I want you to choose green. And I didn't see my green, so let's go back this direction. There's some green. Now, that's kind of a bright fluorescent green, so I probably need to bring my lightness down a little bit. Well, that looks muddy in my whites because I included my whites. Maybe pull the saturation down a touch. I think that's a nice green. Let me hit Command or Control Zero to go back full screen. Yeah, that's. That's a really nice green. Now watch this. If I wanted to make the shoes themselves a touch darker, if I hold the command key while I click on this layer mask, it's going to reload the selection of just those shoes. Now if I add a levels adjustment layer, it's going to give me the same mask, and it's going to allow me to pull the intensity of the shoes down. Look at that. So now they don't really jump out at you. If I pull down this white output slider, so the shoes are green, but they're not so bright. Right? Let me click that eyeball on and off. Do you see how it looks like they're a bit overexposed? Remember, the brightest area of an image is what's going to draw the viewer's attention. And I want the shoes to be prominent, but not from overexposure. So that's why I made that additional levels adjustment after I made the color adjustment. So I enjoy where this is going. Command zero to make sure I'm fit in the screen. I'm actually going to hit command minus to shrink it just a tiny bit. So I get kind of a stepped back look at it. I think I'd like to make the red darker. So how could we do that? Well, if we go back, to that background copy layer. Let me pull this up. If I go back to this background copy layer, try select color range and say select, maybe not localized. Hold down the shift key. Okay, it's doing a pretty good job. I mean, not great, but pretty good. Say I do not want any of the face. There's a lot of red in the face, so that's the problem. And I can also click inside here. I don't have to click in the image. OK, I think that's going to mostly get me there. I'm going to click OK because it is a mask, so I can paint on my mask. And I'll add a Levels Adjustment layer, which is going to create the mask that I just made. Remember, white reveals, black conceals. So that means if it's white, it's being shown. So the red wall is what's being shown. So any adjustment I make is only going to happen on that red wall. Watch. I'm going to make it darker. Look at that. See how I just made that a little darker? Let me pull the dark tones in just a touch. I want to make sure I don't like oversaturate, but I'm, I'm just making things subtly darker. And then if I want to come back for a bit of a spotlight effect on her, but from the background, I'll hit B because I want to paint with black. Right bracket key to make a bigger brush. Make sure it's super soft. Yep, my hardness is zero. And I'm going to click once and I'm at 50%. Click again, make a bigger brush. Click again, click again, click again. Remember, I'm not affecting her. I'm just affecting the background behind her to kind of soften this effect. There we go. I think that looks great. So save this and go watch the next video. Yes! In this video, I'm going to show you how to make this image look like this one. So I want to cover how you can affect a specific color channel without going up to select and select color range. You can let Photoshop do the bulk of this kind of work for you. So if I want to change the hue, or the color, same thing, of say the yellows in this image. We know that I go up to the hue and saturation adjustment layer and just click it. Now generally, if I were to grab the hue and saturation slider, it shifts all the colors in the image. Remember, we can always click the reset button if you've done something you don't like. It's doing it to the master. It's doing it to everything. So if you come over here and you choose yellows, now it's only going to affect the yellow channel and the edges of everything that would touch the yellow channel. Now watch what happens. So even though there's a little yellow in the brick, it's not shifting it that dramatically. So what I'd like for you to do is shift the color until it's kind of this warm, lighter orange feel, like not super saturated reddish orange, but more of a, of a this color. And then don't want the eyes to bleed. So maybe pull the saturation down a touch and the lightness, maybe bring up just a touch. Again, I'm going to turn off my eyeball. So that's where it was. And actually, I would say that the skin tone was actually contaminated a little bit with the yellow cast. So I actually think this adjustment makes the flesh tone look much, much better. And I love the overall image itself. Now, to make it kind of pull together, I think these red shoes 
are out of place for me. So what I would do is I'd go to the background layer and here I would go up to select color range and then I would normally go select all of this. But what if, let me cancel that. What if I add another hue and saturation adjustment? I go here and choose reds. Let's see what happens. Well, unfortunately, what do we see? There's a lot of red in her skin tone, a lot of red in the bricks, and there's a little red in everything, right? So I have to decide. I can either do this, get the chew color to match the dress color, and then here with this mask selected, and I'll click on it so it'll load up here. I'll scroll down until I can see invert to hide everything. Command space bar to turn my cursor into a temporary magnification tool, release the command key, and just hold the space bar so I can click and drag to really fill my screen with what I want to manipulate. And essentially, I want to reveal that new color, and I'm going to do it by painting on this layer mask. I need to paint with white. Currently, black's in my foreground, so I'm going to hit the X key to swap that. I'm going to hit B for the brush tool to activate it. And then if you ever get to a situation where you only see a crosshair with your brush tool, either your caps lock is on, which makes that outer roundness disappear, or my brush is bigger than my image area, which is probably true because I'm zoomed in to 400%. And look how big my brush is, 2200 pixels. I mean, that's giant. So here I would just go quickly drag that down. See, even at 70 pixels, it's pretty big. And then I'm going to paint. And it's okay if I go over onto the brick a little bit because that shouldn't shift too much. Make my brush a little smaller. Ah, I'm painting with 50%. I want to paint with 100%. So I tap zero. You can drag it also to get to 100%. And I'm just going to, it's like coloring in a coloring book. I'm just holding my mouse down, make my brush a little bigger, to paint this a little quicker. I'll go ahead and paint over here. All right, it looks like there's a little bit of red in that brick back there. Make my brush a little smaller. Now here's a quick tip. If you click with the brush and then you hold the shift key and click again and you come down, it's gonna draw a straight line or paint a straight line. So that's really good for, for drawing straight lines. Like watch, I'll click here and I'll come all the way down here and click again and see that straight line. I'll come back up, straight line, straight line. You see how that works. I need a straight line right here. So that's a good way to speed up your painting. These curves, you just have to kind of come in manually and do them. Now, if you went too far, hit the X key and come back and fix where you went a little too far. I'm getting a little bit of a halo there. So I'll come back and fix that. Maybe I messed up her skin right here. I'll fix that. See, I'm painting with black to hide what I just painted with white. So all of this looks weird. So I'm going to fix that little halo. Halos are a common problem. I'm going to fix that. Came in too far, so I had the X. So that's why the X key is so handy, because you can flip back and forth. Hit X again to fix the skin tones. Looks like I messed up right there. I hit X again, come back and try to fix that. Now what I can do is while I'm on this mask is I can feather it a bit. Remember, if you hold down the Alt or Option key, you can see your mask. You can see some of it's good, some of it's not good. So I can feather my mask just a, a tiny bit just to make it more soft so I don't see my errors. Command zero to fit in screen. Now my shoes match the dress and they match the overall color of the bars, of this kick plate on the door. Now let's turn all that off. And I'm clicking and dragging, which will shut off all eyeballs at once. I mean, this is a nice image, but I definitely believe that this makes your skin tones look, look better. The other ones I think had a definite yellow tint. And I think this really pulls the whole outfit together. It's a really quick way to change all the colors based on a specific color channel. Yes. Okay, so now that I've introduced you a little bit into adjustment layers, let's work with another type of adjustment layer, which would be a black and white adjustment layer. Now this image has a lot of color contrast, right? We have this really warm orange colored Volkswagen against the blue and green background. So it really separates itself and makes it for an interesting image. Now, when you think about black and white, since you've already had some introduction to the hue saturation adjustment layer, so that maybe I can just go to the hue and saturation layer and drag the saturation to negative 100. 
But notice it's kind of flat now, like it, that now with the color removed, which was giving us a lot of color contrast and complementary colors, this Volkswagen is now just kind of a similar gray as this background. So desaturating an image sometimes is not the best way. And actually, I would suggest most times it's not the best way. You lose all control of being able to manipulate the individual colors themselves to affect the local subject color contrast. Because right now, this is it. This is all I can do. I mean, I can go up to my brightness and contrast and add that on top and say, I just need more contrast. But based on where the tones fall in the Volkswagen, it's making the Volkswagen darker. So maybe if I make it brighter, okay, now it's this fender is blending in with this. This is now getting too bright up here. It's still not giving me that effect that I want. So what I'm going to do is hold the shift key and select the other layer and just click the trash can icon. And it's going to say, do you want to delete the selected layers? And I'll say, yes. All right. So then what do we do? This is a perfect time to apply a black and white adjustment layer, which is right here. Now, when you go down the properties panel, it, I mean, it looks very much like the desaturated version, but notice I get all of these controls. And remember, you can hover in between the properties panel and that layers panel, get the up and down arrow, and then drag down until you, you're sure you see all the different adjustments. This was orange, wasn't it? Well, it means it's got a little red in it. So if I bring the red slider up, ooh, look at that makes it brighter. If we bring it down, it makes it dark. So I have control over just the Volkswagen, which is what I want. So I think I want to make this a bit brighter. Let's see the yellow slider. So that makes it dark also. So red and yellow is an orange. So now I can make that Volkswagen kind of as, as bright as I want pretty easily without having to select it with complicated selections, without having to do a lot of dodging and burning, which are other options and tools that I have. This is a very quick way to control the, the density of the image. Now, what if the greens, which were, I can make those a little darker if I want them to be more of a graphic element where there's not a lot of shadow detail. How about the blues? Now, here's the interesting thing. Watch when I go really far on the blues to crank it down. The blue channel is the shortest wavelength. It's typically starved for light. And you see that whenever you try to make something bright, really dark, it shows you it doesn't have enough pixel information to make that blue sky beautiful all the way across if you do a lot of dramatic editing. So I've got to kind of pull that up until I don't see that. How about the cyan? How far can I pull that down until I start to see it? Do you see all that problem in the sky? That's pretty much bad, unless you're going for a more artistic interpretation and that pixelation, uh, the artifacting, all of this noise problem, posterization problem. If it's an effect you want, then it's okay. But I want my sky to look more like a photorealistic sky. So that's really as dark as I can go with, with this color channel adjustment. So I'm going to leave it there. Now, based on the other things that I've learned, I would like to make this grass a little lighter. So maybe I'll go ahead and take what I've already learned and I would add a levels adjustment layer and I would say make that grass a little brighter. So maybe with a little bit more black, something like that. Now I'm only looking at this foreground right over here. Remember the rule. This makes every single thing for every layer have that same adjustment. So what I can do is I can grab this adjustment, click on it and drag it down. So now it's only affecting the car itself, not the black and white conversion. But if I want to further reduce this impact, I just need to convert this layer mask to black. Because remember, a white mask reveals, a black mask conceals. I'm going to select this mask, and then I'm going to go to the properties panel and just click the word invert. And see that removed, that hid all of this effect. But now I know I can just hit B for the brush, hit D for default colors to switch my foreground background. Ultimately, I just need white in my foreground if I'm painting on a black mask. I'll look at my options bar, make sure I have a normal blend mode. My opacity's set at 40% because that's what I used the last time I used it, which is fine for this, I think. And now I can just paint. I'm painting on the mask. Do you see how it showed up on this mask over here? I'll hold the Alt or Option key and click on the mask. See, that's what it just did. Click on the eyeball. So anything I want lighter, I click and paint. Click and paint just to drive the viewer's eye a little bit, just to give a balance of tones in the image. Maybe I want that door a little lighter. So remember, photography is about subtlety. So any tool you can learn to make your image exactly the way you want it, the responsibility is on you to learn those tools. I hope this has helped. And once you get to this point where you have your favorite black and white, which is exactly where I want you to take this particular image. Imagine if you wanted to make it a sepia toned image, which is like an old timey kind of a warmish brown. Just make sure at the very top of all your layers then go up and add a hue saturation adjustment layer. Click colorize in the properties panel and just drag the hue over to somewhere to a really warm brown, like not a yellowy green brown, but more of an orangey brownish brown, and then pull your saturation down. I like mine 
be pretty low, somewhere between 10 and 15, because I like it to be real subtle. I think that just looks like a nice old-timey photograph. It fits very well with this particular image. Now, let's say you had five of these or 500 that you wanted to show on your website or you wanted to put in your Instagram post. The key is you have a certain number of images that you want to look like they're all toned the same way so that one's not too warm, one's not too red, one's not too dark. Let's say I have this wedding image and I want the exact sepia tone I've created here. All you have to do is come over to the right side of the hue saturation name or whatever name you've named this layer and then click with your cursor and drag over. Do you see how my, my hand, my cursor changed into a closed fist? Because it's literally holding on to that hue saturation layer. I'm holding my mouse down while I hover over the tab of the other image. And then I'm coming down inside that image and letting go. And notice what it did. It automatically applied the hue saturation layer to the document. It applied the exact same settings I had already applied. And I can do this to any number of images and they will all match. They will all look like they were tinted the same way. I hope you found that to be an interesting tip. Yes! In this video, I'm gonna show you a series of selection methods and ways to retouch small parts to large parts of images. I'm gonna show you how to remove these birds and then how to remove this giant pier. Okay, first, a selection isolates part of an image so you can work on just that area without affecting the rest of the image. When you make a selection with any of the selection tools, you get an animated border, kind of like marching ants that looks like they're walking around the edge of your selection. The area inside that animated border represents your selection. Now, if you ever wanna to add to a selection in order to select more, you can either click the add to selection icon, which changes depending on which selection tool you're on. You'll find that always up in the options bar, or you can just press shift and drag. If you wanna select less to have less to remove something from your selection, just click the subtract from selection icon in the options bar or press alt or option and drag. Now, after you have a selected portion of the image and you wanna make an adjustment, you can do anything to that selection that you want. Apply a filter, you can paint it, you can fill it, you can duplicate it, you can add a layer mask with it, you can add an adjustment layer. Just remember, that when a selection is active, adjustments affect only the selected area of that specific layer. So let's get started. Command zero to fill the screen. Okay, one of the quickest ways to fix this, I believe, is just to go grab the spot healing brush tool right here. If you don't see yours, click and hold and just choose spot healing brush. And this is really great. All you do is just paint over it. Paint over whatever you want to remove and Photoshop will figure it out. So I'm clicking and just painting, same as I did in the painting demo. Generally, you wanna paint a spot bigger than whatever you want removed, but not dramatically bigger, just bigger. And there are like 29 birds here, so you've got to do this 29 times, but this is real time, and I'm done. Now it looks like I have a dust spot here. I'll get rid of that from my sensor, and I'm done. So this is finished. That's how you would remove a few small things. Now what if you wanted to remove, say, this entire pier? Another thing you could do is you could come over to this quick selection tool and just paint over it. But I have to say, this tool works best when it's got color and tone. This particular tool didn't always do great on black and white images. So I'm gonna hit Command or Control D to deselect, which you can find up here under the Select menu and deselect. But the keyboard shortcut, Command or Control D, saves you a ton of time. Well, how about uh, the object selection tool? And I'm gonna just draw a box around it and say the object is the pier. It did an okay job, but I actually want that reflection as well. So I hit Command or Control D. I think for this, I would come up to the old school selection tools, the lassos. And I just do the polygonal or the regular. The polygonal lets you click and drag, click, and then I drag, and it won't lock down until I click again. Pull over, click. This works because it's such a rectilinear shape. When you see the marching ants, that means you now have an active selection that's ready to have an effect applied to it. What I would probably do is just right click and choose content aware fill, and it's gonna try and figure it out. Now it's pulling from the green areas. So if you don't want it to pull from the mountains or the sky, unpaint those, right? Remove those from it and it's a live update right over here. So I'll click on the plus icon and I'll paint all this. It's like, yeah, all of that looks good. And look over here. See, it's it's auto updating as we go. And I think that actually looks really good. I'll just click OK, Command D to deselect. It's gone. Like we have removed an entire pier just with those short techniques. So let's try it with this image. Let's use that same technique. Let's try the hand lasso tool, which is kind of a free hand draw, something like this. And you just wanna be a little bit in front of your subject. 
doesn't have to be super good. Now notice I got the guy's shirt a little bit right here. So I'm gonna hold down the shift key and just add to that selection, let go. See how easy that is? Now there's another tool. If you click and hold in the spot retouching area and choose the patch tool. Now this particular image may be a little bit not the right size, but I'll try. I'm gonna click and drag and I'm gonna say patch it with this area over here, but I don't have enough area to go over to, right? Like it's, it's not gonna work. I don't have enough to pull from. So I hit Command and Control Z to undo that. Then maybe let's try Edit and Fill. Oh wait, look at that. Another place to use Content Aware Fill. But if I didn't choose this and I just chose Fill, you can actually drill down in this dialog box and choose Content Aware. You have a lot of ways to get to the same exact place. Click OK. Didn't do a bad job. There's some blurry edges here. I'm gonna hit Command Z to undo that. So one of the things I'm concerned about is I'm about to do everything on my background layer and I typically don't like to do that. So I'm gonna hit Command or Control D, Command or Control J to duplicate the layer. And just to save myself some time, remember any of these selection areas will activate the Select Subject button. Let's see if Photoshop can tell what the subject is. You know, it, it didn't do a bad job. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab the polygonal again and click back at the source point. There we go. Now I'm going to right click and choose Content Aware Fill to bring up that quick dialog box because I want to see what it's choosing. And I want to tell it by holding down the Alt or Option key to, you know, yeah, add this, add this. Maybe I'll toggle on high color adaptation for right in here. Still like it. I'm going to click OK. Command D. Did a decent job in the foreground, right? Command one to zoom in. Like I don't see any problem here, but right around here I start to see my line. And here it looks a little blurry. So here's how you would fix this part. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna merge this with this by hitting Command or Control E. See how it squished it all together? Then I'm gonna grab the clone stamp tool which is right here. You can also hit S. To make this work, you have to Alt or Option click. You're gonna get a bullseye with your cursor and then you click where you wanna paint from. So I'm gonna paint from this area right here. See how I line that up so you can pull it over. Now I'm painting at 100% and that's a little intense. So I'll Command Z it. I'll go down to 60%. I'm talking about the opacity. You can lower or raise it just by dragging over the word or you can just hit the number. I can hit eight for 80%, four for 40%. See how that works. Option key for the bullseye, select there. Make my brush smaller. Maybe that'll help make it not so ridiculous. Gotta be 100% it looks like, but that's too dark. So I'm pulling from too dark of an area. So I hit Command Z a couple of times and start over. Let me start from this area. See, that doesn't look good either. This is sort of the problem with the clone stamp tool. It takes a lot of back and forth. So I just want to get rid of the blurriness. So now I need to fix this line. I want to be hard. Now I'll come over here and hit seven for 70%, just to kind of blend this in a little bit. Maybe I'll hit three for 30%, see if I can somehow make these blend together a little better. I'll come from the other side. You see what I mean? This, this part's a little difficult, but remember we moved a giant pier, but as we keep working it, we're gonna get a better and better solution. Now let's see if an adjustment layer will also help camouflage what's going on. So I'm gonna go up to the vibrance, which you know how to use now. I'm gonna say anything that's muted, please give it more color. I like that. And then I'll pull up the saturation as well, just a touch. Command minus. I've gotta say, turn that off and back on. I still see this tiny blurry area. I don't know that other people would, but you can continue to work at it and kind of get it to where you want it so that people don't. I think for a quick fix, this looks really good. So I'd save it out and keep on moving. Yes! Okay, in this video, we're gonna to pull together all the techniques that we've learned. We're going to remove this person. We're going to remove these signs, this little yellow thing. We're going to duplicate this bird and put a mirror of that bird over here on this post. We're going to remove this person again, but we're leaving the shadow. All right, let's get started. I like to hit Command or Control J when I'm starting out on a big project like this, so I'm never working on the background layer. See, I duplicated the layer in the background, so I can always come back and see where I started. Now, let's start with the easy stuff. I'd go to the Spot Healing Brush tool right here, and I'm gonna get rid of that yellow thing because my, my, my eye wants to go towards it. I'm gonna hold down the Command and Space Bar to temporarily activate the Magnification tool and click and drag, Space Bar only to move around because I want to get rid of this. I'm still gonna use the Spot Healing Brush tool. Left bracket key to make it a little smaller, and I'm just gonna paint right over that sign and let Photoshop figure it out. Didn't do a bad job. Hold the space bar and pan over. Sometimes you might have to make a couple of passes. Yeah, look at that, kept that line sharp and crisp. All right, so now let's start getting rid of this guy. Now here's the thing with this one, command minus just to shrink this out a little bit, space bar. Now we know that I can come over here and grab the object selection tool. Let's say I just drag over the person. You know, it's not doing a bad job. 
I'll try to go to Select, Modify, and Expand by 20 pixels. I'm going to hit M for the Marquee Tool, hold down my Alt or Option key, and say, don't bother with everything below this. I'll fix that myself. And then I'm going to right click and say Content to Wear Fill. And look over here. I don't need to change a lot. It didn't get this part too well. That's OK. I'm just going to click OK. I think it did a decent job. Command D to deselect. Look at that. I mean, it's a tiny bit blurry right here, a little bit right here. But we know we can come over to the clone stamp tool, select it, hold down the Alt or Option key to get a bullseye. And I'm going to click there. And I'm going to say, yeah, just paint right here. It's not doing a lot because look up there. My opacity is only 30%. If I hit zero to go back to 100, I think I want 100 for this because I really want to get rid of that little soft blurry patch. I'll do that. Option click there. I think his head was up here. So I'll camouflage that. Didn't do a great job with that line. Not a horrible job, but it's not a great job. Let's see if I could do better just by option clicking on the horizon line, coming over and see, I get a preview of whatever I'm about to paint. So I'm, I'm going to see if I can paint a straighter horizon line than what it did. Yeah, I think I like that better. So now let's come down to the water area. I'm going to Click on this side. Hmm, those tones are lighter. That's not working. Just come back from this side. Make my brush a little smaller. Now here's the thing. This is where it's going to get a little tricky. I think I'm going to actually try to get right here. And see if I can. I'm getting where these two boards intersect. And see how that looks. I'm going to come over here. Option click. Option click on that little part right there. See, the lines aren't ma matching up. There's ways, sophisticated ways you can fix this, but this is a beginning thing, so I'm not going to get into the specifics of that part. Click over here. You see how I'm going from one side to the other? Usually that helps it blend in a little better. And if I hit 6 for 60% opacity, just to make this a little darker, something like that, a couple of passes, and maybe I'll come from this side. Hit 3 for 30% with a softer brush. Command 0. And look at that. We've gotten rid of the guy. OK, so I want to copy this bird. Probably going to do it quick and dirty to start with. I'm just going to grab the rectangular marquee tool right here. Make a selection around the bird and get a top of the post. And I'm making sure that I'm on the layer that has the bird. Hit Command or Control J. I hold down the Alt or Option key and click on that eyeball. It turns off all other eyeballs on the layers panel. Let's me see what I got. I got just the bird. Click again to bring it back. Now I hit. D for the move tool and just drag the bird over here. Hmm. Notice how the metal and the wood aren't lining up. The dark's on the left side instead of the right side. I'm going to hit Command or Control T, which is free transform. You can find it up here at Edit, down to free transform. It'll put a bounding box around the selection. Right click and choose Flip Horizontal. And that just flipped my bird horizontal. And now I can move the bird wherever it lines up. Command Spacebar to zoom in so I can see what's going on. Spacebar only. Ah, look at that. I don't know why, but that post is a little blurry. But the post on the other side is kind of sharp. So we're going to need to blur this up a little bit. I'm going to try to move this where it most lines up. So it's not perfect here, but that's as good as I can get it for now. I'm going to hit Enter to lock it down. I'm going to add a layer mask. And I'm going to see how much of this I can just do by painting. So I hit B for the brush and hit X because I need black in my foreground in order to paint on a white mask. Look at my tool options bar. I'm at normal and 100%. And I'm just going to paint on my mask, which is going to hide. Remember, white reveals, black conceals. Hit X because I painted too far. X again so I can continue painting this part out. Left bracket key to make my brush a lot smaller, which would be more accurate. And I'm going to paint this real quick. Six and a half hours later. Here I'm painting with a lower opacity of like 30% to try and blend the top post with the post below it. So I really want to hide that sharp line. 6 for 60%, 5 for 50%. Just try to just try to camouflage it. Okay, once I'm done, remember command minus see how blurry this post is? I need to make this bird a little blurry. So I'm going to select the bird, go up to filter, down to blur, and I'll just choose Gaussian blur for a very quick blur. That's a touch too much blur. So pull this radius down until it looks believable. That's still too blurry, I think. Just a subtle blur, something like that, not even a pixel, maybe a whole pixel, 1.1 pixels. 
It's going to be so small, it won't really matter, but I want you to really pay attention to those details. Command zero to fit in screen. Now, what else have we learned to do? Let's add a vibrance. Pull up the muted colors, saturate it a bit. Do we want to add a black and white adjustment layer? Maybe. Maybe let's add a blend mode to that black and white adjustment layer, like overlay. Soft light. It gives it a really unique look, makes the pier look a lot wetter. If you hover over the blend modes, it does them. Real quickly, the first word in each group tells you what it does. So everything in here darkens one layer to the next. Everything here lightens one layer to the next. And then they vary by degree. Overlay is a term for contrast. So this boosts the contrast and color saturation of all the ones in here. So for me, I think I like soft light the best. Turn it on and off, see how powerful it is. Well, I like it on the pier, but not on anything else. So what I'm going to do is this mask, I'm going to click it, go to the properties area, and invert it. Well, I need to turn it back on. And what that did is that hid that mask. So we can't see anything that it's doing. But watch what happens when I hit B for the brush. I look over and I hit X to bring white back to my foreground. Tap the right bracket key, hold it down, it'll grow fast. And I just paint over the pier itself. Remember, your eye is going to go to the brightest part of an image. So I just made the pier the brightest part of this image so that it really goes to it. Now I can add another black and white adjustment layer. And this time, just lower the opacity. That's another way to mute the colors if you wanted to. Or do I like it black and white? You know, it has a lot of interest either way. So I'm just going to click and drag this layer to the trash. I'm going to leave it in color. And I think we should crop it to a pano. So grab the crop, clear it if you've got anything preset up, right? And minus. So I think I want this to be a pan, as in I want it to be kind of long and skinny. But I want to keep the, sh the reflection totally there. Maybe something like this. Very symmetrical. I like that. Click enter, man zero. Yeah, save that for your project. Uh-oh, what do you see? See this little red thing? Don't know what it is, but I'm gonna have to get rid of it. If you ever get confused, like you don't know what layer something is on. Wait, there's a bonus tip. Yes! If you're on your very top layer, my favorite keyboard shortcut is Command Option Shift Letter E. That's Control Alt Shift Letter E for Windows users. It compresses every layer you have, whether it's 5, 50, or a couple thousand, onto the very top layer. So you know what you're working with. So I know if I grab the spot healing brush, I can paint over that, get rid of it. Command zero to fill the screen again. That's my image. I would go up to file, save as. It automatically changed it to a PSD file, which is perfect because it's got layers. I'm going to click save and I'm done. And just so you know, if you like this one, there are going to be other courses and lots of short videos coming quickly. Courses on layers. Courses on retouching, blend modes, Photoshop for landscapes, special effects, black and white conversions, and my favorite thing, compositing in Photoshop, among so many others. If you like this video, make sure you whack it, smack it, and crack a lack it. Yes! Hey, what are you still doing here? It's over. Actually, all kidding aside, I hope this video helped. And if it did, consider subscribing. I like subscribers. That's awesome. What? You just took one in the jugular, man! Huh. Whoa! Yes! <laughs> god. Oh my god, I did! This is hey, you stayed to the end. You know what that means. You're awesome. I'm talking about you. Now get out of here. <laughs>